Good afternoon, viewers. Welcome back to the latest episode of the Free Marketers podcast slash vlog. Um, despite the apocalypse going on around us, we are here in the office to bring you guys this new episode. Uh, we're going to talk about the coronavirus and the, re the announcement about the interest rates this week. Um, and we might cover one or two more extra topics at the end, depending on how time allows us. This week, I'm joined by Mpiaki Glamini and Martin von Staden. Jacques is off somewhere in the wilderness. We hope he's surviving, <laughs> as I said, the apocalypse. So hopefully we'll <laughs> hear from him very soon. Um, guys, the biggest thing on everyone's minds all around the world, the coronavirus, um, this yeah. pandemic sweeping yeah. the world. My personal view, you know, um, would be very much on the the sort of side, not even the side, but just the line of, of caution and, and mm. reason, mm. not overreaction one way or the other. Mm. Um, I think it is quite a, a big threat, but maybe not as big as has been made out to be. But, you know, that being said, none of us are qualified medical professionals, yeah. so we won't give any medical advice. That's just our, you know, my personal view. Martin, I'll start with you. Um, just your general view of things maybe you can touch on some um, regulations and things like that that have been announced recently especially yeah. in south africa we can touch on international matters as well but let's let's start locally well i guess in general i think i i guess i'm a bit worried about the coronavirus i keep seeing this number of between 40 and 60 percent of the world's population may pick it up mm -hmm. but i keep seeing this in the press i don't know if it's true I don't know how far the data or the facts support it, but I keep seeing it, and that is a massive number. Mm. For 60, 40 to 60% of the world's population gets this thing. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to be a whole lot of uh, elderly and um, uh, people with pre-existing conditions who are going to be in massive trouble. Mm. So my thinking around this has consistently been that if you are over the age of 60 or you have a history of conditions, you need to have a one issue thing in your mind mm. and that is you need to stay away mm. that may mean you lose your job that may mean you lose some weight <laughs> but it, it it's it's quite important for you specifically to stay away uh, from other people otherwise it, it may lead to, to well. disaster and i mean obviously there's going to be massive economic fallout from this mm -hmm. so it, we, we can't avoid that but what we can do is try our level best to ensure that we survive and for us who are relatively young the, the the risk is relatively low so we can still get away with going out even though it's not recommended but if you are in that vulnerable group you need to stay away mm -hmm. but then on the civil liberties issue i almost touched my face um the government i think it was sunday they announced that they're gonna declare a na national state of disaster mm -hmm. it's not a state of emergency yes. there's a slight difference um and now under the disaster management act they've promulgated these regulations and some of the highlights from the regulations are that the gatherings of 100 people or more are prohibited mm -hmm. um it's 50 people in institutions that <clears throat> that sell alcohol um, or where alcohol is consumed uh freedom of speech has been somewhat limited now that uh, if you are uh suspected of intentionally deceiving someone mm. about either the virus the infected status of a person or the government's response to the virus mm. you could face up to six months in jail um, and a fine which they don't specify mm -hmm. uh, visits to inmates in south, Af south africa's prisons have been suspended um, and it's it's stuff like that but i think those are the highlights mm. uh, but in, in addition to that and these are in separate regulations that i haven't seen yet so take what i say you have a pinch of salt government has also issued price controls mm. on certain goods the canned certain canned foods and all a list, yeah. um, face masks stuff mm -hmm. like that um and then uh, which something we may talk about later but there's also been requests that have gone out to certain companies to lower the prices of their services mm -hmm. but we all know a government request is uh, often the prelude to a government insistence mm. and the government uh, uh, compulsion uh, and some of these companies are now complying but but the point is that i'm trying to get at is that the scope of our individual liberty is shrinking somewhat yes. uh, within the context of this emergency and to be totally honest with you i think if there is a disaster fair enough in some cases fair enough uh, but the problem is that in many cases i'm not sure if i can say most cases but in many cases governments after the crisis has abated mm. they say well we actually like this new power yes. and we think we'll keep it and that to me is the major concern mm -hmm. if these new restrictions apply for the next few months 
sure. But if they become indefinite, like passports, which were also temporary uh, measures introduced in the 1910s, mm. uh, they became permanent, then I have a problem. And I think South Africans need to be uh, very vigilant yeah. in general and not let their guards down just because there is a, a crisis. That Civil does tend to or, happen with mm. crises and disasters, isn't it? Um, mm. Governments do sort of go in that direction of increasing their control yeah. under the guise of protecting the people, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. And there might be very many or most people who are well-intentioned mm -hmm. with these things, but yeah, they'll they'll keep them afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and Piaki, we'll come to you. What do you think of what's happened in the last week? Um, I suppose now, I don't know, a few people are saying South Africa is now at the point where Italy was a month or so ago um so things need to be managed very well now or it's going to go the italy route um so i saw so something yeah. on news 24 i don't know how accurate it is but they apparently got it from anonymous sources uh, it's, it's some of the, um, the the predictions from the models that the, the government is supposedly relying on and from what from what from what these models are apparently are saying between 12,000 and 8,000 80,000 south africans could die based on whether we're talking about a 20 40 or 60 percent infection rate mm. so that's uh if you think about it that's uh, I, I i hate to minimize it but that's not too many people mm. out of a population of 60 million people mm. Mm. and so this is it's going to be bad oh, no doubt but especially i think the biggest problem is overwhelming the health infrastructure right so that, that that is probably more of a bigger problem than actual people dying i'm sure most people have heard of this phrase now flattening the curve yeah can you just explain that a bit so as so, you mentioned now with the healthcare system so or how this the, uh, uh, pandemic starts is they start out with the exp exponential growth so if you know an exponential growth curve it goes something like it, it goes like low 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 for a long time and then it suddenly shoots up and mm. goes up so what they're talking about is about flattening the curve is when it starts shooting up then you start pushing it down and then you eventually flatten it okay. and then you eventually it starts trending will be a drop off again no? yeah so it becomes it, it goes from an exponential curve to more to something more like um, a plateau uh, a, the bell curve mm. oh, okay. So, okay so it goes it becomes something more like that yeah <sighs> yeah i don't think any healthcare system around the world is perfect in that mm. it can actually have I don't know, however many beds are needed or respirators or anything mm. like that. Mm. So I suppose that's the most important consideration for governments now is trying to, you know, mitigate the spike. Well, I think that an important thing that uh, has been happening around the world, but including in South Africa, mm. is that there, there's this idea that healthcare providers shouldn't overinvest in their infrastructure. Mm. They shouldn't have too much capacity, right. as silly as that may sound. But this is the case in many American states. It's the case in Europe. And it is kind of the case in South Africa, although it's relatively unclear. But mm. I think uh, that there is a lot of regulation in that respect. And that's this idea that if the healthcare providers overinvest in infrastructure, their prices are high. And the government tries to keep medical uh, healthcare prices low by telling them that they cannot invest this, this much in, mm -hmm. in healthcare infrastructure. And if they do, they need to get permission from government to add like 10,000 extra beds or mm. build a new hospital. All of this needs to go through some regulatory maze. Mm -hmm. And now, now everyone is justifiably concerned that there is no one country, not even the United States, which has the greatest uh, healthcare capacity in the world, has enough to, mm. to uh, um, contain this virus if it reaches a certain uh, mm -hmm. Uh, rate of spreading sure. and I mean we could have avoided this uh, maybe not uh, totally avoided it but at no least you can never do that no. far more beds available sure um, and in South Africa we, we certainly don't I think the last number I saw was something like 4,000 critical care beds mm -hmm. will be available for coronavirus uh, uh, sufferer mm -hmm. victims mm -hmm. um, that's nothing no. close to the number that uh, Mbiaki talked about of, of up to 80,000 people mm -hmm. could die from this. Um, so it's a massive problem. And if we get through this, and I'm sure we will, mm. the government needs to very, very seriously reconsider its whole philosophy as uh, when it approaches healthcare matters specifically, but the economy in general. Mm. Uh, as we can see, our already suffering weak economy mm -hmm has now just been totally uh, 
well, railroaded yeah. by the coronavirus. If there was any hope of any sort of economic growth, yeah, it's, yeah, no, it's, it's out the window now. It's gone now, so now we need to just make sure we, we can make deal with what we have. Um, but government needs to now understand that this needs to end. Mm-hmm. We get through this, mm-hmm. it's, it needs to be over. Mm-hmm. There's no more nanny state, competent state stories. Mm-hmm. Now it's we need a growing economy that can accommodate crises like this. But let's play the devil's advocate line and just, for example, with China, where the virus originated in the originated in the Wuhan province. I mean, now it looks like China's has, you know, it's they're over it, they, yeah. they've, and that they took a very totalitarian approach. Mm. Mm. So, <laughs> well, no, I mean, the Chinese uh, economic growth has been pretty healthy over recent years. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's. I think we've long realized that political freedom and economic freedom aren't necessarily to end up. A lot right. of people have said that just have political freedom and economic freedom will follow and just have economic freedom and political freedom will follow. Mm-hmm. But China is and Singapore and Rwanda are yes. examples of that not being the case. So it's not like we say that totalitarianism just can't achieve anything in mm-hmm. life. It absolutely can achieve many <laughs> things in life. Um, Break a few eggs to make an omelet. Yes, is that but, what Stalin said? <laughs> but if our... I guess our base assumption is that human beings need to be free mm. in general. Yes. Uh, we, we should almost put it beyond even considering that totalitarianism is an answer to any of our problems, mm. that we would rather all go extinct <laughs> rather than have that. Um, but the point is still there that China has liberalized immensely mm. since the 19, I think, 80s. Mm-hmm. So it's not, it's not a totalitarian society per se, I would say. Mm. Um, but... Yeah, fair enough. It it had a, a very high capacity government, and right. they could they could do this. I mean, if the South African government was somewhat competent, I'm sure they could also pull it off. Sure. But you should never throw your eggs in that basket of assuming that government will be competent. Mm-hmm. Rather, decentralize it to the the market, the private healthcare system to mm. solve the problem should it arise. And it looks like South Korea actually did better than China, right? Because what China did to solve the problem, they took drastic measures, yes. shut down whole cities and <laughs> all of that. South Korea just let their free market handle it. They mm-hmm. they could produce the most test, test kits in the shortest amount of time, and they could get a, a large proportion of the population tested, mm-hmm. and then target those people, deal with those people. Mm-hmm. They yes. enough capacity in the hospitals, so like it it looks it looks like an action movie what china <laughs> did it looks cool and dramatic <laughs> but actually the most effective thing is just let markets work yes. and solve the problem for you mm. well yeah. just to look at some examples here in south africa mm. and in in the us and europe i think so in south africa for example if you you know for anyone who's worried about if let's say we we sort of go back on regulations that kind of thing but then you know the private sector won't you know it's just pro- profit driven it won't help anyone it, it you know that sort of thing that sort of line of argument well pick and pay they very early on may set specific hours for for older people to come to the shops mm-hmm. as they realize that they're more at risk mm-hmm. um i know louis vuitton they they produce obviously lots of like handbags and fancy products that cost you however many thousands of dollars per product but they as i was listening to a podcast today they've directed a lot of their manufacturing capacity to manufacture hand sanitizer mm-hmm. and they've done that without you know government forcing them to do anything mm-hmm. uh, in the u.s a lot has been said about how bad their response has been initially but a lot of that can be attributed to their regulations that they were on um testing labs all that sort of thing because they all have to go through the the um through the the centralized um mm. drug FDA. agency the yeah. fda mm. So don't assume that just because that regulations are the only thing that make businesses, you know, do the right thing that you would consider. Businesses will do the right thing according to what their customers' needs and wants are. Mm-hmm. If they don't, then their customers will go somewhere else. Yeah. yeah, and I think just an important point maybe that jumps out of that is that this coronavirus spread is a perfect example, I would say, of this fallacious idea that if you have controls on countries' borders, mm. that such things can be somehow stopped. I mean, when you go through our Tambo, they check you for fever and all these things, but yet people still came in. And mm. it's because the virus only starts showing symptoms for uh, two weeks after you get it. Mm. Or, or you may even go asymptomatic the entire time mm-hmm. and spread the virus. 
yet there you have this massive group of people who talk about the importance of having strong borders so that we can make sure that people infected with such diseases do not come into the country right. it doesn't work it does not work mm. um it's here it's here it was gonna it was always going to get here mm-hmm. um and uh, us responding in a inhumane and anti-human way was not gonna work mm-hmm. um there are the the only way that i've seen so far of controlling this virus is to make sure you don't that you self isolate that you self isolate and don't get, get unnecessarily mm. go in between other people whether they're foreign or na- native it does not matter you mm-hmm. need to self isolate we're breaking the rule here of course <laughs> um but that is that's the only way you can stop the spread of the virus mm. so put this idea of closing borders closing airports and stuff out of your mind mm-hmm. that that ship has sailed mm-hmm. long ago so even I was going to mention with South Korea and them being probably the best example of how a country handled it, they just identified exactly where it originated mm-hmm. and then try to track down who those people were in contact with and then get them the treatment and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So there was nothing about, you know, closing the country off. Yeah. Yeah. They stopped flights to Wuhan province, which mm-hmm. fair enough, you know, it originated there. So you can make a stronger argument for mm-hmm. isolated cases instead of the whole country just shutting down. Yeah. Which again, and, and furthermore, countries can't survive that. Mm-hmm. So we wouldn't, you shouldn't do that in in the cause of preventing the virus, whereas you might cut yourself off from the resources you need to fight the virus. Exactly. Um, in today's globalized world, we mm-hmm. need an in- interconnected trade system. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, I think we'll move on to the next topic. Just to wrap that one up, yeah, just everyone stay stay healthy, stay as oh, safe as one, you can. One note yeah? is uh, those price controls are going to lead to shortages in the shop. Right, right. So Absolutely. expect that to come yeah. eventually. Yeah. Yeah. I think the supply chain would have managed just fine. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no that, that's why we have prices in the market. Yeah. Because if, if the if the supply chain is close to breaking point, then markets have to raise the price so to keep the supply going. Mm. Yeah. And then if it's the sub, so supply chain is, is is under less pressure, then you can mm. keep, yeah you can keep supplying the goods. Mm. And so this this all of these things feed into each other, and it's the economic impacts are going to be worse than the health effects. Yeah. yeah. So we'll see how long it takes South Africa to get out of this. I'm yeah. guessing quite a few years but mm-hmm. yeah that's again part of the well, the struggle of being here yeah. we didn't we didn't recover from the 2008 crisis <laughs> up until 2000 is 2020 now so 12 years we haven't recovered from yeah, that crisis no so we have another crisis now we like compounding things in south africa not yeah, compounding yeah. savings just compounding crisis it might just wake the people up who've been sleeping up until now well, maybe maybe um, Piaki, for our next topic, I'll start with you. Um, the announcement by the Reserve Bank about cutting interest rates and mm. the repo rate. Uh, could you just give us a sort of, I guess, a summary of what it means um, in what aspects it might be good, if there are any? Um, I know that our Austrian view is that there aren't any good aspects of it, but yeah, I'll, I'll hand over to you. There is, there is, I, I don't see the good in this. I mean, it's uh, fair enough. It's it's following the, 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 the Americans, the mm. Canadians, the British in 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 responding to coronavirus with monetary easing, mm. but like as commentators keep asking, what is monetary easing going to do to a virus? I mean, <laughs> this is it's trying to solve a health problem with monetary policy. It's sure. not going to. It's, if people are if people are scared that they are going to die, no matter how much money that central bank throws at you, you mm. want you want to start to go out to shop now because. <laughs> Your life means more to you than cheap money. I think if I got a thousand dollar check, I might go and do something with it. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll save it and then they'll just take it away from yeah, me for this enough. very same interest rate that they've got. So. so so from from about the end of last year, up until the, the uh, up until currently, so South African interest rates on the ten year government bond have been spiking. Mm. There is uh, it's actually the, the it's actually the biggest spike since um when was the last one i think since 2002 okay yeah so that, that that's quite significant and i even seen people writing about it but this the 10 year bond is sort of like a country's benchmark bond so, so why the, why would it spike on that? so let's just to give you an idea it, it's it went from 8.9 something to 11.93 when i checked it last okay. night so that's that's quite a significant move like the like i said the biggest spike since 2002 and if you remember in 2002 we were dealing with we were still dealing with the currency crisis yes. the rent had devalued so investors were before the budget speech it seems like investors were pricing in the the, the, the size of our debts and how bad it is okay and then they, when 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 what happened in america started happening it just went up even more than mm-hmm. that it just went up crazy it just went crazy it broke it broke all previous uh, highs and so this is 
so the, the the cut in the interest rate it was most likely a response to that by the governor of the reserve bank just the fact that the 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 the, 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 the bond deal was 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 skyrocketing in south mm. africa and the reason it was skyrocketing is because investors were dropping what they consider to be riskier assets like mm-hmm. emerging markets mm-hmm. uh, emerging market bonds and going to safer assets what they consider to be safer assets mm-hmm. like uh, european bonds japanese bonds mm-hmm. american bonds and so it, 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 while that was happening there were also other structured, we, we were less preferred also relative to other emerging markets sure. so as as all the, all the other emerging markets were getting hit we were getting hit even more mm-hmm. and so this is so the, this knee jerk response is going to make things less because obviously the best way if if investors are telling through their through their actions in mm. the markets are saying to government okay we want a higher yield in order mm. to hold your bond mm-hmm. you can't solve the problem by cutting by by cutting interest rates yes. you can only exacerbate it so we we, we will continue exporting capital <laughs> if you want to import capital you need to actually raise interest rates yes. and get them up to the market rates and allow capital to be attracted from overseas and also domestically so mm-hmm. save more mm-hmm. because they are earning more in their, in their interest bearing their bank accounts so you've given us the the i think the realistic and the the, the negative uh, view of this so mm-hmm. why why are people so excited about this because i, so I read a lot online and you know in the newspapers that this is great you know for south africans even, that's not even the worst of it another problem is that we are facing a supply shock so it means we'll be getting less goods so by lowering interest rates mm. they are giving us more money but mm. we have less goods if you understand your Australian economies you understand you see the problem here is that uh, you'll have more money but less goods it means there'll be more money chasing fewer goods right inflation yes so they are they are, they are creating inflation as we speak because to them you see if you have to understand how central banks think for them deflation is worse than inflation so okay. whenever they see a risk of deflation they would rather go with inflation mm-hmm. deflation forces governments to pay off their debts <laughs> so this is why central banks would rather have inflation even though it punishes you as the yes. consumer as the saver sure. but yeah. if government wants us to have more money why don't they just cut taxes i mean surely uh cutting that to zero uh would have an even greater effect than making us uh have less uh, or less debt payments i so, mean surely that makes more sense inflation is basically the best tax that anyone has ever invest in invented oh so government wants to make money out of this whole thing okay yeah <laughs> of course they, so what a surprise they want us to have more money but they also want more yes no, they, they they want a payday from the coronavirus <laughs> so, Jeez. yeah so the, the, the thing is if interest rates spike uh, as as the bond market was sort of indicating and then we have so much debt remember in 2002 i think we had much less debt as a percentage of Absolutely. gdp than mm. we do now and so if 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 interest rates if if they if the reserve bank just sits quiet and allows the interest rates to spike then government debt suddenly becomes more expensive which means they have to tax more mm-hmm. so what's the what's the alternative to having to tax more well inflation you punish the consumer but you save the government from its irresponsible decisions and south africans are cheering with yep. glee yep. that because, government is doing this because they they their debts will also become cheaper so it's, it's almost like that's why it's like it's, inflation is the perfect tax because everyone feels like they're benefiting people uh-huh. who have debts mm. the only people who get really um who get the, the bad end of the stick are people who save money if you value saving that's surely pensioners are going to hit by, get hit by this yeah it's going to be hard for them because they're going to be hit by the declining <sighs> declining the stock markets the decrease in the so they're going to be getting less yields on their savings it's, and they get see less it's that it's the coronavirus the markets, yeah. it's, it's i save all my money it's, it's a massive <laughs> issue for me it's it's insane well. and then they they tell us from from a young age you must save mm. saving yeah, so is good and then they I don't punish. think we have a very good saving culture in South Africa. No, we don't, so this but is, it's uh, because, you, they, because it's punished. Right. Yeah, yeah you, you punish you exactly. Mm. You, you need you need to be watching that infla- in those inflation numbers like a hawk. If you mm. if mm. you are still if you still want to save in a South mm. African bank account, mm. you need to be watching those numbers. So sorry, everyone, to burst your bubble if you were excited on that, but we have to bring you a, maybe a dose of reality here. So um, that's that's our perspective on on the, this interest rate cut. Um, I think we'll just quickly touch on one last uh, topic, and that was the announcement today by MTN that they're going to slash their prices by 50%. Um, This is in response to pressure that has been put on them by ICASA and the Competition Commission. And Vodacom announced something similar earlier in the week. I can't remember the exact percentage, but there was something similar. This is part of those those bodies, those agencies, their view that the um, data costs too much that the cost of data is too high and i put that in in quotation marks for a reason because 
no one can tell you whether the cost of something is too high or not. If people buy it, it's not too high. Um, that's that's one way to look at when these exactly. these sorts of epithets are thrown out. Mm-hmm. Actually, look at what they mean um, and what the concepts themselves mean. Uh, just Martin, I'll go to you first. Um, I, I guess I I read some of the the press statement by MTN and that they said this was a voluntary social compact that mm-hmm. they're. So I haven't read through all of it, and I'm not sure if they've you know adopted everything that ICASA and the Competition Commission you know <laughs> told them that they had to. Um, they did give them, I think it was two months at the beginning of the year, and that was mm-hmm. extended by another yeah. 30 days to, to comply or not, and then, then steps would have been taken. So just your view on, yeah, on sure. this. I, I mean, also don't think, sorry, you've uh, also read it all in detail. So, no, yeah. no, but uh, there, I think everyone should see this as part of a broader context. So this has very little to do with the coronavirus. So obviously, Ikasa said that in, in light of the coronavirus and people having... Uh, uh, having to stay home, they may lose their jobs, etc. Mm. Please give them some relief. Uh, don't make them pay so much for their data anymore. So obviously, this was a great opportunity for ECASA, but this is a years-long process from ECASA and the Competition Commission of trying to force mobile operators, but also other data providers, to lower their prices. Uh, the Competition Commission report that I'm still studying uh, from late last year. Uh, goes into detail about um, how it's it's in how these companies are quote anti-poor mm-hmm. and uh, some of the reasons for why they're anti-poor is because when smaller companies try and out uh, uh, have better prices than the big ones the big ones then follow them down yes. because oh my goodness consumers are choosing to stay with these big companies mm-hmm. and you see that's that's wrong mm-hmm. because consumers that shouldn't have these this choice no. so if the, you have to actually leave your preferred service provider if their prices are too high that's apparently a rule now um, but that's the competition commission's approach and the coronavirus couldn't come at a better <laughs> time for them because now mtn and vodacom or whoever else would look like i don't know what's the word social pariahs yeah. if they weren't going to do this mm. because oh my goodness oh that caricature of the the yeah. fat capitalist sitting in his boardroom exactly. with his cigar so this coronavirus is is, is actually a, a massive win to those in government who want to extend the sphere of government control because mm. now when the virus is over surely these companies cannot just say oh optimism the virus is over and by the way we're raising our prices by 50 percent that's Mm -hmm. gonna look Mm -hmm. absolutely terrible but there are going to be economic consequences to this because this is not a a, an economic in in the sense of a a sound economic decision proper economics being forced upon them by circumstances to be fair and it's it's not a decision that the business would have taken on business principles Mm -hmm. which is what we should want Mm -hmm. because that's more efficient and even though it may be painful in the short term in the long term it leads to a more prosperous economy so i mean everywhere price uh, signals in the market are being perverted heavily Mm. Uh, and and it's not the virus that's doing it not only the virus it's governments uh, adding on to that so we may be happy now that prices have now gone down by 50 percent but a possible consequence that i can think of is that this will be the last price reduction in decades probably so they will never reduce prices again because of the massive and basically enforced Mm. price reduction that well we also shouldn't be surprised if we hear for example that mtn and vodacom might do job cuts at some point because they're gonna have to how are they gonna yeah and they're their national coverage may also decline mm. because they, those two companies specifically, spend billions of rands in in infrastructure for their network, mm. and the smaller operators piggyback off them mm. because they don't have nearly as much money to mm. do the same. So now that they're gonna lose a hell of a lot of money, mm. you may see that, especially rural, less profitable areas, are simply gonna mm. get disconnected. And of course, the Competition Commission and ECASA are gonna have something to say about this. Yes. So always bear this in mind uh, uh, viewers whenever government solves a problem Mm. it is usually the government's own uh, problem that it created that it is solving and its solution that it is implementing now is going to need its own solution from government a few years down the line that Mm -hmm. is the cycle of government intervention in the economy and that is why we need a separation of government and economy in the same way we have a separation of church and state it's just a perverse cycle with no end Bjarke, anything you want to add on that one? Yeah, just to quote Rahim Emanuel, the former chief of staff for President Obama, 
which is never a waste a good crisis. <laughs> exactly. yeah. I think that's a perfect note to end on. Viewers, we thank you once again for joining us. We hope all of you are, are managing out there if you're working from home. If you're still going into the office, try and uh, stay as safe and healthy as you possibly can. Take all the precautions you think are necessary. Uh, please uh, remember to um, subscribe to this YouTube channel. Please like our video and share it. Thank you to those of you who have been doing so. We really appreciate the support as always. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please find us both on Facebook and Twitter, Free Market Foundation South Africa. We're still continuing our, our um, output, writing articles and media releases, releases and submissions and the like. Please find all of that at www.freemarketfoundation.com. Uh, we'll hopefully talk to you guys again next week if circumstances allow. Until then, stay safe and we'll talk to you again soon. Bye. Cheers.